so my name is Albert. Uh, I am a skull and engineer by day, but I do classical in my free time. So uh, most of what I've learned about objectives has sort of been in a scholar context, and uh, I think it might present an interesting perspective uh, in the actual world. So that's sort of what I'm doing today. Uh, so it talks all about a quick bit. Uh, one of the motivations for this talk was because I'm going to ask you all the attention, it seems. Uh, quick bits are like the middle child between Funker, Quick and Ahmed. And so middle child uh, needs love as well. So we're going to do that today. So uh, just to start things off, uh, this is, uh, I believe, what a quick bit looks like in a standard library. So it's got two operations. It's got, uh, it's called what we call an app uh, and peer. So app just takes a function within uh, the f effect. And then a value in effect and applies the function to the value. Uh, and a peer just takes just like a plain value and then lifts it into that effect. And to sort of give a quick introduction, these are some example instances. So for either uh, the, the instance is pretty straightforward. If you have the right function and then the right a, you just apply a function to the a. If either side is left, uh, you just give the left biasing towards the first one. And then peer is just you, you back up in the right. Uh, the list one is slightly more interesting. Uh, so you have effectively a list of functions and you have a list of values. Uh, and you're going to take each function in the list and apply it to the list of values and do this for every single function. And then you'll end up with one giant list of values. And then here just takes it and, and puts it in the, uh, in the single list. So uh, we, we use the same interface or we use the same sort of definition in, in Scala as well. And it's, it's, especially in Scala, this interface isn't really, uh, it's, it's kind of weird to look at because it's not really clear where the, the function within the F comes from. Uh, in Haskell, you can sort of see it because you, the way you work with duplicative with the, the F map and the, the app, uh, you can see where if you try to F map with a binary function, you'll end up with uh, a function in, in, in the F context. Whereas in Scala, for, for Scala reasons, that doesn't really work out well. Um, so it's sort of hard to, to see where, why applicative looks this way. Uh, and another reason that's kind of weird to look at is if you go look at the laws for applicative, uh, contrast with laws for like functor and runet, they can be sort of weird. So functor has like two really simple laws, it's identity and uh, composition, and the monad is identity and associativity. Uh, whereas applicative, you have like homomorphism and like interchange and stuff like that, which uh, could make sense, but they're, they're kind of, they sort of stand out uh, uh, compared to like functor and monad. So the formulation that I like to walk people through uh, and the formulation that ends up working better in Scala uh, is sort of like the lax monoidal functor uh, view on applicative. And lax monoidal functor is really just like a really fancy way of saying I can zip two things together uh, or I guess product them together. So if you have an A and, and an F and then you have a B and an F, uh, you can take those two Fs and sort of smash them together to get, uh, get the, the product A and B. And unit is just, uh, is basically just pure. Uh, so, so this sort of, uh, when I teach this, it sort of fits more nicely into the way I like to approach it. So when I talk about functors, uh, I like to say that you have, functors are a way of working with a single uh, effectful value. So you have an f of a, so it's a instead of f of x, and you have a pure function from a to b, uh, I can apply a pure function to this single value and get an f of b on the other side. Uh, for applicative or monoidal, on the other hand, I can say this is for working with multiple independent values. So I have my f of a and f of b in hand already, uh, and they're independent because I don't have to like know anything about f of a. You have my f of b; they're, they're just given to me, uh, and I can take those two and do, do the the simplest possible uh, thing to compose them, just to just pair them up, and then to actually run a binary function across this, I can f map across the, uh, the paired thing. So monoidal or applicative is all about working with multiple independent effects. Uh, and then I can go further and say monad is about working with multiple dependent effects, where uh, M of A is sort of a program that when you run it, will produce the A value. Then you take the F, uh, the A to M of B, and apply it to that resulting A to get the next step of the program. And then you end up with uh, the M of B. Uh, so, so this, to me, provides a really nice transition between working with one, one, uh, one effectful value and then working with multiple independent ones, and then working with multiple dependent ones. Uh, this just sort of prove, like very roughly, uh, that these two formulas are equivalent. You can implement one in terms of the other, uh, but I won't get into detail. So the loss side. So one of the things I complained about earlier about applicative were the loss were kind of weird. Uh, so the last monoidal functor loss. Uh, there's I guess two or three of them. Uh, so the first one is associativity. 
So associativity means if you take uh, an F of A and zip that with an F of B, and take that and zip it with, an, uh, with FC, if that should be isomorphic to taking F A and zipping, up, zipping it with the result of zipping F B and F C. Uh, and I say isomorphic here because if you actually like do it in code, it will be structurally different, but you can put the isomorphic. So you can use F max to sort of recover the quality uh, to sort of just like reassociate the parentheses. Uh, but but this looks nice on the screen. And then we have identity, which is if you take an F A and zip it with uh, lifting like the, the unit into F, uh, that's isomorphic to lifting the unit into F and zipping that with F A, uh, which is isomorphic to just F A. Uh, so these are the laws for um, for lax monoidal functors. And uh, do these laws like look familiar to anyone? They're sort of you have identity, you have left identity, right identity, and associativity. The operation you call it zipping is the, the zipping operation you have there. Mm -hmm. What what is that exactly? Uh, oh, so uh, I should maybe use the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically you take the so I, I drew it as the, the binary operator, but it's uh, this thing uh, where you have the F A to F B, and then you you just do the use the. So these laws are pretty much one on one with the the actual monoid laws. So uh, monoid says if you have an A and B, if you append A and B, and then you take the result of that and append it with C, that's uh, the same as taking A and appending it with the result of appending B and C. And then you have an identity for each monoid, uh, which in our case was, in the previous case, was just the, the unit value with it. Uh, if you take a, any A and append it with identity, that's the same as taking identity and appending it with A, which is the same as uh, not doing anything with A. So uh, both the name and the laws for lax monoidal functor sort of very closely resemble uh, monoids. Uh, and so we can realize that in a data type called const. So const uh, has two types. So const is a relatively simple definition. Uh, it has two type parameters A and B, but it only ever carries uh, a value uh, of a type in the first parameter. So the second type parameter sort of just floats around. It's called, it's called phantom. Uh, it just appears at the type, the type level, but not at the term level. And we can define a monoidal instance for const, given that we have a monoid instance in the first type parameter. Uh, so, so one thing, to, one thing to really keep in mind here is const. Uh, is to remember that const only ever stores a value in the first type parameter. The second type parameter is completely uh, ignored. So, in the in the zip case, we have uh, you can think you have const a x zip with const a y, uh, which really just means you have two a's and you need a way to smash them together. And we can do that because we have the monoid constraint on this a. Uh, so we uh, sort of ignoring the, the const noise to unwrap and wrap the new type. Uh, we just get the a's out uh, of both sides and smash them together, and then we wrap it in const. And then for unit, uh, we need to go from some x to a const a of x. Uh, but const doesn't actually store a value of type x; it stores a value of type a. So we need to conjure an a from somewhere. And uh, the only way we uh, the only way we can do that is through monoids uh, empty operation. So now the interesting thing is, can we can we prove that this is uh, a lawful monoidal functor or uh, the constant a lawful monoidal functor? So the operations, so the law needs to be satisfied at least for associativity. Uh, this one, uh, I don't, I'm not going to cover left and right identity, but they sort of follow from this one. Uh, so if we expand out the left side to do the whole unwrapping and unwrapping thing, we get that. And then to to shuffle away the the const, the unwrapping and wrapping noise, uh, we can sort of Say we're going to take the A out of the constant and then we're going to depend it with B. Uh, we do the same thing with the FC part. So we have A and pen B and pen C. And then we associate this. And we can do the same thing because we know one of the laws for monoid is associativity. And then we just do it all the way, you reverse what we just did, and you end up with what you have on the right side. And I think this is a really uh, satisfying way to, to view uh, the, the relationship between something like applicative and something like monoid, which uh, you might. Uh, might be presented usually in, in separate contexts, but I find it valuable to sort of uh, to show this identity because the monoids are very like uh, compositional and right? you have two things and you smash them together to get one big thing. Uh, applicative is, is very much the same idea. Do we have any questions so far? So a lot of my the, the rest of this talk is going to be predicated on my understanding the, the first half. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to run under time. So if anyone has questions, I can address them. If not, I'll move on. So, what would this look like for other applicatives? Like, what would be 
I guess what, what, what would you gain from the monoidal uh, perspective? Um, so, so monoidal will be equivalent in power to a primitive. Uh, oh, no, sorry. I mean, I, I didn't mean monoidal like the type class. I mean, like monoid, like, like mm -hmm. looking at it like it's a monoid. What do you gain from that? Perspective relative to sort of the traditional. Uh, way for me, it's, it's just it's primarily just uh, it's on principle. It just feels more appealing to me, like the the, the proofs and stuff. The uh, laws are simpler. Yeah, the laws are simpler, uh, and you really, I think it's a it's a nicer way of thinking about applicatives as working with multiple independent uh, independent effects. Because mm -hmm. if you have one value and right. another value in an F, how do I uh, compose them together? Makes sense. Uh, whereas with the function, it kind of felt weird to me. Uh, but in, in practice, in Haskell, uh, using the the A, the, the arrow B inside the F uh, can be nicer. Yeah. Right. Just syntax wise. But teaching wise, I, I like the the more little approach. Okay. So uh, one of my favorite functions that involve uh, applicative terminal is traverse. Uh, so I didn't write traverse in the full generic. Like if you look at traverse in a standard library, it's not going to be list of A. It's going to be like T of A, where T has a traversable instance. But this using list of A here for to fit on the screen and uh, make it simple. Uh, so traverse basically, so that's the definition. But traverse you can think of as you have a list of A's, and for each of those A's you have uh, an effectful function to run on it. Uh, which will be, so you take an A and you produce an FB, and it'll just take uh, each of these FBs across the list and sort of accumulate them. So you end up with a F of list of Bs, as opposed to, uh, if you just use FMAP, it would just be a list of F of Bs, which can be really annoying to work with. Uh, and so this, sort of, this looks like really <coughs> over generic sometimes. Uh, and so I, I find it helpful to sort of think about it when we fix F to be certain, uh, to be different things. So we fix F to be IO. Uh, you can imagine this IO being something like fork a computation to some expensive computation. Maybe A is like a user ID, and then for each user ID, you like go to the database and get information about that user. Or something. So you have a list of user IDs, and for each of them, you fork off a computation, and then uh, at the end, you join them together. So it's sort of like a fork join or a scatter gather. Uh, and then you fix F to be either, then that's what you can sort of think about as uh, validation, input validation. So maybe A is like a list of strings or a list of user input, and you want to make sure the, the input is, is good or each string is like an integer or something. So you have a validation function that, that takes a string and produces either some error value or the, the, the validated thing. And then uh, the, uh, the result of this will be if, if any one of these validation functions fail on the list, then you just get the first failure. And if they all succeed, then you get right of all the successes. So traverse is a pretty uh, generic function, and uh, there's sort of a, a running joke, at least in the, the Scala community, which is if someone comes into the IRC channel and their question begins with, I have a list of, chances are the answer is going to be traverse, uh, and that is surprisingly like often the correct answer. Uh, so they often be like, I have a list of features, how do I get a feature of a list, or I have a list of options, how do I get an option of a list, uh, and so the answer is traverse. So uh, taking a closer look at uh, traversing with either's. Uh, this is pretty much the same thing as uh, the applicative instance for either. So if you have, if you have two rights, we, we pair them together. If you have a single left, uh, we give the left back biasing towards the first one. Uh, but the, the sort of unfortunate part is if you run traverse with either, uh, you only get the first error. It has short circuiting behavior. Uh, so here I have a list of even numbers, and my validation function basically checks to make sure that none of them are even. And so when I run this, I get just a list of two. Uh, but earlier when I talked about monoidal, I talked about like monoidal is very about, or afflictives is very much about uh, handling independent effects, which means uh, in a context of validation, I should be able to validate each of these things uh, independently. And so it's kind of annoying that uh, maybe for user input, uh, if it only gives me the first error, I fix the first error and then I run it again and I get the second error and then I run it again and I get the third error. That's like super annoying. So can we fix this? Well, either is sort of, uh, uh, they're sort of like doomed to be short circuit behavior because the, the applicative instance for either has to be consistent with the monad instance for either. And the monad instance for either, monads are, are all about uh, dependent effects, sequencing dependent effects. So you can't really, uh, you can't really have either's applicative instance uh, do independent validation without, unless you want to be inconsistent with the monad instance. But what we can do is just write another data type that pretty much looks like uh, either. So instead of left and right, we have failure and success. And the functor instance for validated is pretty much the same as the functor instance for uh, either. 
So where it gets interesting is when we define the applicative or monoidal instance for validated. Uh, so if you have two success values, you pair them up as usual. Uh, here, I'm actually going to inspect that uh, if I have a failure and a success, then I return one of the failures. Uh, and where it gets interesting is if I have two failures, I'm going to actually smash them together uh, using semigroup. So I have a semigroup constraint on this instance here. And so it's at this point where we actually see uh, sort of parallel validation. If I have an error on the left and an error on the right, I'm just going to use the semigroup instance for that error to, to accumulate errors. And even this uh, <coughs> success. And so now when I run validate, uh, instead of using left and right, I'm going to use uh, the validated data type. Uh, when I use failure and success, it's going to actually run through the list and use a, and now use uh, this new applicative or this new monoidal instance to actually uh, accumulate all the errors together. And so this is really valuable, say, for uh, reading configuration or for doing anything like user input validation, where you can now say upfront in one go everything uh, that's wrong. So you're not doing things like fix the first error, reload, fix the second error, reload. You just get all the errors upfront. Is there a corresponding limit of some square? Or like a reasonable one for so, validated. Yeah. Uh, you won't. You will not be able to define one without it being inconsistent with the applicative instance. Because okay. because monads are very, are very much about. Uh, you need to have the result of the first one before you can figure out what the second right. one is. Uh, so. So you would. All right. You wouldn't be able to check. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just too much power. Yeah. Uh, so so applicatives gives you weaker, uh, weaker power, but more <coughs> static reasoning ability. So right. you sort of have the two things. Uh, so which is why we wanted to find a separate data type as opposed to, and then maybe you can use like lens to, to make it so you don't have to like go back and forth between the two. Uh, any questions at this point? Can I see your validated uh, Um, Why the semi group code stay? Because I mean, because we need a way, uh, so what we're trying to do right now is uh, when we do validation, if we have more than one failure, we want to be able to get all the failures together. Uh, and so we need a way to to basically accumulate. So, so in some sense, you just say, say monoid again, right? Yeah, we use monoid. I mean, oh, uh, well, you, you wouldn't need monoids. Uh, you just wouldn't need it. Right, yeah. So you couldn't use monoid, but you would have this extra. Uh, you just need another hand, right? And, when, and we're all about using the weakest subtraction. Uh, so we just need just more instances of semi group uh, than monoid. So so one point of that is uh, in, in Scala we have this we often use a non-empty list. Uh, to, so so here I used uh, just a regular list. We use not a lot of the time uh, you will want to use non-empty list because uh, with list if you do get a failure then you know there's at least one error right that happened. But if you just use a list then you sort of have to then further inspect to see if the list is empty or not empty, which can be really annoying even though you sort of know. Uh, whereas if you use non-empty list, you're guaranteed there's at least one, uh, which uh, which is not nice because you don't have to resort to anything unsafe. Uh, you uh, yeah, um, uh, in this example, um, let's say those were all odd numbers. What would the actual result, uh, what the, the, the type encapsulated in success look like for, for this function? Uh, it would be a success of the list of all the odd numbers. Oh, so it would be success and then exactly the success, same. Uh, so if this was 135, it would yeah. be a success of 135. Okay. Yeah, so if you, uh, let's see. Yeah, so if you look at that, mm -hmm. uh, you have the success of the, if a valid, so here the type would, F would be validated of some E. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so you would end up with validated E list of B. Okay. Um, it short circuits, right? If you had like a three in the third place, or, or, you know, if you had two, uh, two, four, three, six. Would, would you wouldn't get the six. Two, four, uh, you, would, you, would get the, you would get all the even numbers. Uh, you six. Yeah, you would get so if you had two, four, three, six, you would get two, four, six. Okay. Yeah, so so the way that works is uh, so like it'll hit two and four first. So it'll take this two and four and, and smash them together, and then it'll, it'll have that, that new failure, and then it'll see three, it'll see failure and success, and it'll just continue on with the two and four, and then it'll see two, four, six, and then it'll smash those two together. So you'll get so even if like some of them fail and some of them don't, you'll just get all the failures. Cool. Does that library exist? I saw that for peer script. I was wondering. Uh, I I don't know. I don't think it's in the standard library. Uh, but I I think there's I'm, I know there's at least one library. It's called validation. Validation. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the guy who wrote that. I think Tony wrote that library, right? Tony Morris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's also the guy who brought it into Scala. Um, <clears throat> so for the unit, um, your very definition though, why is it success and not failure? 
because uh, so, so, so signature of unit is going from A to validated E of A. Uh, it's sort of the, the non satisfying answer is that the only thing you can do at that point is rapid and success. Uh, but in general, unit is the thing that just takes a pure value and lifts it into the context without doing anything. Uh, so, fail, so validation with the error is sort of the context, and you have a value array. So it's just something that's always su successful. All right, um, so more about Traverse. Uh, <clears throat> Traverse is really cool. Uh, and I, th I think it's a really satisfying way of, of motivating a uh and why you want to click it and not own end. So uh, going back to what Traverse looks like in a standard library in its fully generic form, uh, you can see uh, the it has two superclasses, which are functor and foldable, which uh, also kind of weird, but, but let's take a look at that. So Traverse is, again, uh, A to F of B. You have a T full of A's, and then you sort of run the, the effectful function uh, across the T. And so functor and foldable have uh, functor is uh, a to b and you have an effective function and then you uh, or you, you can think about it as a pure function lifted into the t context and a fold map is you have a t full of a's and then you for each a you uh, you turn it into some m where the m has a modern instance and you sort of take all, all your uh, your t full of m's now and then use modern to smash them all together and if the t is quote empty then you can return then you get back the, the empty value associated with m so if t was list then you basically do uh, you map them, you map all of them into a monoid and then smash them all together. And these two look fairly different uh, than traverse. Uh, F map sort of looks the same if you squint enough. Uh, fold map looks very different, but we're going to see that we can actually implement both F map and fold map in terms of traverse uh, if we're clever enough. So uh, F map. Uh, so if we have a traversable, that means we are able to use uh, to use this traverse function. And so if we look at the type signatures, they almost align. But uh, we have this one small annoying thing, which is we have this f, right? So in the, the function, uh, in the function argument, uh, f map is give, uh, you give f map an a arrow b, and traverse wants an a arrow f of b, and then uh, the result of f map is just going to be a t a t of b. Traverse is going to give you an f of t of b, right? So you have this f this extra f wrapping things, uh, which can be kind of annoying. Uh, but because we're the ones calling traverse, we're the ones that are able to pick which which applicative we want. So uh, if we pick some applicative where uh, that applicative doesn't, where you can freely uh, wrap and unwrap that applicative, and it does nothing more other than just like fit the shape of an applicative, then we can, we can sort of make a work. And so we can do this by picking the identity applicative, where uh, the identity literally just wraps about, the identity of A literally just wraps about your type A, and it sort of exists just to make the, the shape of line for applicative. Uh, and so, so we can implement fmap by choosing the applicative to be identity. And so now uh, what, what happens is uh, we traverse across this in, uh, the T with the pure function A and B, but before can traverse the, the B, we wrap it up in this, in this identity so it knows, so it uh, satisfies the, the F of B part. And then it's gonna hand us back uh, an identity of a T of B. And we can just go ahead and unwrap that because all of this is just wrapped in. So that's the right identity part. So fmap, is, uh, FMAP in terms of traverse, uh, basically traversing with no effect. Uh, that's the identity of it. The trickier one is uh, full map. So this one looks significantly different than traverse. But uh, again, if we're, if we're clever enough, we can think of something uh, that, that fits. So uh, traverse wants this f of b, and it's giving us an f of t of b. Whereas the function and the result of full map is just going to be f. There's no like f involved. There's not even a b involved like there was in f map. Uh, but we do have this monoid constraint, and we think about what full map is supposed to do. It's basically supposed to just smash all the all the uh, m's together. And if we recall, we do have an applicative that uh, a ignores uh, or has nothing to do with the b, despite it appearing in the type parameter, and also has a way of smashing these together uh, in an applicative instance. And so that's the const data type that we saw earlier. So if we substitute const const of m uh, into traverse, uh, we have a arrow const m b. Uh, arrow ta, arrow const m tb. Uh, if you sort of peel away the fact that const m of b is really just an m, you get a arrow m ta m, which is exactly a full map. So uh, like we did with f map, uh, what we do is we apply the f in full map to get the m, we wrap it up into a const to make traverse happy. Uh, we traverse over it and we get the const of m tb out, which is really just an m uh, underneath. 
and then we just unwrap it to, to satisfy fold map. And so what happens inside traverses is it has all these const values together and it's trying to smash them all together. And the applicative instance or the monoidal instance for, uh, for const is really just uh, using the modeling instance for the first time around. So fold map in terms of traverse. Uh, so that's cool, which means that traverse not only, you can not only view traverse as uh, a general way to do like uh, fork join or to do like input validation, but it's also talking about just general traversal over structures, right? Traversal uh, to smash things together, traversal to, to just apply a function on each element. So traverse is super useful uh, <coughs> tool to have. Any questions at this point? Um, can you go back to the um, slide where you had uh, the definition of traversable? Definition of traversable on this one? Yeah. Um, so that just maybe a typo on functor that's supposed to be an F, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it should be a functor F, functor F foldable F. Yeah, I don't know if you're reusing these slides, but if you're just. Yeah. Out. Yeah, I'll, I'll remember that. Yeah, that should be. Functor F foldable T. Is it? Uh, no, it's, no, 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 that's right. right. Yeah, functor, functor T foldable T. So, uh, so if, if you have a traversable of T, uh, then you then you know that based on what we, uh, we just talked about, you, you can get a valid functor instance for T and a valid foldable T. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Never mind, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what's the difference with the functor? What's the, excuse me? What's the difference? Uh, the difference. Uh, uh, functor is weaker than than traverse. Uh, so so F map can be implemented in terms of traverse. Traverse is like the fully general form. Uh, if you have traverse, you can implement uh, functor's F map in terms of traverse. Uh, you cannot go the other way. Then. So what's the weak point? Is it? What is the weak? You said it's weaker than. Oh, uh, so if you so like. Uh, if we go back to traverse. So if you look at, let's hide that. If you have this thing. Uh, so if you had A to F of B and a T full of A's and T was just functor and you try to say, so the only thing you do with functor is, is map over it, right? So if you map over the T, uh, the T of A's with this effectful function, you would just end up with a T of F of B. You wouldn't get the F of T of B. So in the case of, uh, so if you substitute, uh, say, so fix T to be a list and then fix F to be IO. Right, so you have A to I O of B, uh, arrow list of A. You would, and if you just F back over it, you would get a list of I O of Bs, which is, and then, but now you want to, you don't want to work with multiple I O values, right? You want one I O value at the end of the day to eventually feed through uh, to main. Uh, and so you would then have to do something like fold over it and then like sequence them. Traverse basically does this in one, uh, in one, in one call and generically across uh, any applicative, not just I O. So, uh, so click it. So, if you if you statically know how many effects you want to compose, uh, so if I know I have exactly two or three or four effects I want to compose, I can I can just use a click it. But anytime you have a dynamic uh, number of them, so like user input or like uh, user inputs like the big one, uh, you don't know how many things the user is going to give you, right? They can give you zero, one, two, three, however many. So you you all you have is a list. So basically, anytime you have a list of effects that you want to uh, smash together, you would basically you would need traverse. Would those execute in parallel then? Or... Uh, if you have if F has an <coughs> instance that so if F was like async or something, I don't know. Uh, so so in Scala is called future. Uh, uh, if it had if the applicative instance does parallel, then this would be truly a, a fork join. So, so when I said parallel earlier or like independence, it doesn't act actually run in parallel. Uh, it can just like for a specific, it has the ability to. Uh, and so the independence is what allows you to say, run this feature or run this async in, in one thread and run this other in another thread and then join them together. Yeah. So if you had if you had a monad instance, uh, you would not be able to run in parallel because you would have to wait for the first async to complete and then get that value to get the next async to run. So it's very sequential. So I have a tangential question that I think is interesting. So I see this paradigm all the time where people use the cost functor and the identity functor. Uh, I'm sorry? I, use this I see this paradigm all the time when people use the cost functor or mm -hmm. the identity mm -hmm. to illustrate examples. Mm -hmm. uh, in your eyes, you know, why is that a useful thing to do? Is all this knowledge. 
I will have an example for you at the end. Uh, and it's one of my favorite examples. It's, it's that example that, that made me want to give this talk. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, specifically const. So ID, identity isn't that interesting. Const is the interesting one, uh, where you can take any monoid and, and lift it into an applicative, and that becomes valuable in a bit. Or I hope it becomes valuable in a bit. I hope it motivates you sufficient. Uh, anything else? Uh, so another really cool thing that applicatives have that, uh, for instance, monads uh, do not necessarily have is applicatives compose. So uh, so one way to compose is sort of uh, in a nested way. So compose uh, f g a is just f of g a. So if f was like i o and g was list, it would be i o list. Uh, uh, so if you have if the uh, if f has an applicative instance and g has an applicative instance, then you can just arbitrarily take their composition, the nested composition, and you're doing an applicative instance for that, no matter what f and g are. So that's cool. Uh, the more interesting one, and the, the one that I'm going to use uh, in, uh, in a bit, is uh, product composition, which is if f is a applicative and g is applicative, then the product of f and g are applicatives. Uh, so uh, product, a product of f and g just means you have like a tuple uh, of f a and a g of a. And then if I have an f a and if I have a pair of f a g a and I have a pair of f a g b, then I can get the pair of f a b and g a b. So that's product composition. Uh, and so specifically to, to frame it back in the, uh, the monoidal way, uh, so this is what I talked about. Uh, the uh, product is basically you can think of it as a tuple of FAGA. Uh, so you have an FAGA and FBGB, and then you just uh, you compose them point wise, essentially. And the same thing with unit. Uh, and if we look at the, so mono is composed product wise as well. So if you look at the monoid uh, product, we have the product a comma b, and then you have another a comma b. Uh, you get another a comma b, and you just do again point wise uh, smash them together. And so if you the, the type parameters change in monoidal, but if you if you hold if you treat f as a thing that stays constant as the sort of like the a monoid, uh, then then it's basically you have you have all these f of x, and you're going to uh, you can compose point wise uh, in a product way. Uh, any questions on that front? Because I think I'm about to, yeah, I'm about to go to the next one that's going to address your cost thing and also show why I care about product composition. Uh, so I'm going to hop through some code. So ignoring the bottom half for now, you're just looking. Can you see that? Okay. Can people read that? Cool. So uh, are people familiar with free monads or are, uh, yeah, so, okay. So free monads are, uh, without getting into a theory, they basically give you a way to define uh, a set of operations as a, a, a generalized, uh, as an algebraic data type. And then you can do things, uh, it'll basically give you a, a monad instance across uh, this these set of operations so you can sequence them. So if, if you write a, a, an ADT that represents like file IO, which conveniently is what I have in the next uh, code block, where you say like read and write, then you can lift that into a free monad, and then you can say do read, then then do a write, and then do another write, and do a free, and then and all that does is give you a, uh, effectively an AST, uh, a syntax tree that uh, keeps track of how these things are sequenced, and then you can pass it an interpreter, and depending on what your interpreter does, it'll do different things. So you can pass it an I/O interpreter where it'll actually do the file read and write, or you can pass it like a an interpreter that uses like a state monad, so then you can use that for testing. Uh, so it separates structure from interpretation of, of what you're trying to do. So free applicative is like the applicative uh, analogy in that. Uh, I actually ripped this off of uh, some scholar code, so I don't know if this is how it should be defined uh, in Haskell. Uh, I think I ripped it off your code. I think you were the one that I did. <laughs> so, so if it's bad, blame Lunar. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we have this free applicative, uh, and we have this interpret function that uh, given any free applicative f of a, uh, you can interpret that into a G so long as that G has an applicative instance. Uh, and this, the second thing, this thing here, is your interpreter. Uh, so if we, if we hit a pure node, then we just use the, the, the pure of G to, to let that value in. And then if we have the, the app node, then uh, basically uh, run the interpreter recursively. And then lift can take any F of A, right? So F is completely unconstrained here. So it can just be an algebraic data type that you made up like just now. 
and then that'll lift it into a free applicative template. So I don't really want to get, I don't know if I have time to get into the theory of this, uh, but just know that like it gives you a way of taking any algebraic data type that you've made up and lifting it into free applicative. And then we can have a functor instance for, uh, for any free applicative, and we can have an applicative instance for any free applicative. And this is completely unconstrained on what uh, that f is free applicative, right? So you, you really, uh, you, you can you write your algebraic data type and then you lift it up. Uh, there's not there's nothing extra that you can do. Uh, so here I have, uh, so here is an example of an algebra. So this is written as a generalized algebraic data type. So I have a file read operation and a file write operation. Uh, so read will take a file path and produce uh, the file IO of the string because uh, it'll read the, the contents uh, of the file. And then write will take a path, a string to write to the file, and then it'll return unit because there's no useful value for me to give that. Uh, and then what I do is uh, I take these and I lift it into the free applicative, right? So I'm not really defining any instances. Uh, file read and file write are just conversions. What's, what's the, the fandom A for? The fan oh, so it's not, uh, it's not, it's not fandom. It's a uh, generalized algebraic data thing. So depending oh, on, oh, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So depending on what constructor I use, the A will be a different thing. So that'll be important in a bit. Uh, so yeah. Uh, lift into free applicative, and then I have these file read and file write functions that just uh, lift it into the free applicative just for convenience reasons. Uh, and then, so now I'm going to define two uh, two interpreters. The first one is going to be uh, let's see, I don't want to shoot an edge. Okay. So uh, I'm going to have one interpreter that doesn't do anything. It just basically counts the number of operations that I have for a given uh, free applicative. So uh, I have two trackers: the number of read operations and the number of write operations. And the mono instance, so I'm going to define a mono instance for this. Uh, and so that will be related to const in a bit. Uh, and so if I have the, the empty number of count operations is just nothing. And then I can take two count operations and uh, sum them uh, piecewise, right? So this is just like a glorified pair. Uh, and count operations will actually, well, this is count ops is going to be the actual interpreter. So it's going to take uh, a, a value of our algebra, so the file IO of A, and give us a count ops. So if it's file read, then I uh, then I increment the, the read counter. If it's a write, then I increment the write counter. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't mentioned applicative yet, but we'll get to that in a bit. And then I'm going to write an actual, I want to show you guys that again. Uh, I want to write an actual interpreter that takes a file IO uh, uh, instance and gives me the actual IO action associated with it. Right? So in the case of a file read, I'm just going to do read file and read from the standard library. Uh, and then if it's a file write, I'm just going to write the file. And so now what I can do, so I have two independent interpreters now, right? So I, I happen to have to find them in the same file, but like these could have been like defined completely separately. They know nothing about each other. Uh, and so in my, maybe like in my main program, uh, I can write an actual interpreter that's the composition of, of these two interpreters. Because uh, for one, we can lift, so count ops is a monoid, right? So we can take that monoid and lift it into const to get our const applicative. Uh, and furthermore, applicatives compose product-wise which means I can take that cost applicative and compose it product-wise with the actual IO applicative. So now I have an interpreter that does uh, analysis, uh, so like static analysis kind of, and then actual, those are actual IO actions. So that's where cost uh, comes in useful. Uh, so this is basically just shuffling things around to make the, the types line. Uh, so given a file IO of A, I can get the, the product of the number of operations and uh, the IO actions. And then, uh, so my main loop, I can now say, uh, let's see, yeah, so uh, I can write an algebra, so this is my program here, all right, file read, file write, so I'm going to read hello.txt, and then I'm going, and after I do that, I'm going to write hello into hello.txt, so I have one read operation and one write operation, uh, and then I can lift, uh, so that's, this part is my, uh, my file IO program, uh, but really it's just the data type at this point, and then, uh, B3 will actually run my, my joint interpreter <coughs> across this program. Uh, and then Go is the thing that will just display it through the screen. So if I now actually uh, run this, oh no, oh, I think it's going to call it the Apex 17. We'll see. Uh, so here, let me actually. So I'll put a hack in here. Uh, and now I'll run this. And so we see there was one read operation, one write operation, which is true inside our program. Uh, and now if we actually see hello.txt, the old hack string was over into the hello, because that's what happened in our program. So 
basically what's happened at this point is I've defined interpreters completely orthogonal to each other. They could have been like separate modules, separate packages. And I'm able to, inside my main program, compose them all together and do like single pass uh, interpretation in my program. One which does uh, analysis on them and the other that actually does the thing. And furthermore, if you want to get super fancy, uh, because monoids themselves compose product wise or method or whatever, you can, you can just do whatever fancy monoid analysis you want. Uh, so define the monoid instance for that, uh, and then lift that into a const, and then take the const and compose it with applicative. And you can do all sorts of things uh, by composing monoids, lifting them into applicative, composing applicatives, uh, so on and so forth. So you can go really crazy with like having all these independent things, and then at the end of the world, uh, composing them together to do what you want. This was really cool. I was wondering, is this practical for real world use? I remember like reading about like it's too slow. Too. And very practical. Um, the, I have I have this I have the Scala version or a fancier Scala version of this running uh, in production right now, which based, which uh, essentially does like logging instead of doing like operation counting. It does logging on, uh, in tandem with actually executing uh, the thing. And so I was able to you're able to define like the logging. Uh, so it's like basically right now. Uh, define a logging monoid uh, in one place, and so this this place just cares about just about logs. And in a completely separate file, I say, all right, this is what I'm going to act. This is the actual thing I'm going to do. And in my main function, I take these two things and I, I compose them. So, the, so from the library perspective, it's very clean. You don't the, the static analysis doesn't know anything about the actual thing. It's just responsible for analysis. And then it's in the, at the very top level uh, in my application where I'm like, all right, take these two interpreters and I want to do them single pass. Can you? Um, sorry, but, um, when you're writing a program like this, does it ever occur where you're like, oh, dang it, I actually do need a monad constraint that you have to rewrite, or do you have some intuition for saying, like, actually, will not need those constraints at all? Oh, so like when I did, when I figured out if I need a monad versus semi group? Um, no, when you figure out if you need the, uh, like, if you need a monad structure. Oh, monad, uh, monad. So like, <laughs> uh, basically, the first question, whenever I'm dealing with effects, which is like often because that's the interesting programs for it, um, I just, I just sort of ask myself, are they, do I need these to be, are these independent? Do they have anything to do with each other or do I need to sequence them? Uh, and so for like config reading, we're just like read this field, this field, this field, this field, these four have nothing to do with each other. So I'll, I'll use like validated there. Uh, but if it's something like, uh, like run this, run this async job and then after I like go to the database to get like the, the row and then based on what the result of that row is do this other thing, then I know there's a dependency there and so I don't have to come on either. And there's gonna be a talk today about the monad version of this. So. so if you wanted to write what you read from the file back, if you wanted to write what you read from the file, you would have cannot be that correct. Yeah. But that would that would involve knowing uh, what the result of, of reading it was. So here doesn't what you said like they're, they're independent, but but the order does not like if you wrote first and then read you would get something different. Yeah so it doesn't mean so you can't run it they're independent but it doesn't mean you can run them in arbitrary orders or links don't matter. Uh, ordering is observable unless, uh, like in certain cases. Oh, so, the mechanism will still, will still um, honor the order. Yeah. I think I have kind of identified the thing. Um, in the gadget that you described, mm -hmm. you don't ever, in the final type of the thing, have a function from like D to whatever A. And I think as long as you don't have that callback function, you can do it in an applicative structure. No, because it's still like the whole point of the, the free applicative is that you can. Chain these things in order. So if you could, if the if the 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 a if the value a of one of your one of your ADT um, constructors could be the input to another, you could still in theory chain them if it were uh, monadic, even if you don't actually ever explicitly take the uh, the a to mb in your. Okay. So the, the question I generally just ask myself is, are these, do these things need to know about each other? And the answer is no, then I, the first thing I go is applicative. And then maybe later on I realize they do. And then, I mean, it's easier to switch, it's easier to switch from applicative than not. And you could use the exact same ADT in a free, you know, like the effect, when an effect. In the free mode, you could yeah. do it in a free mode, but you wouldn't be able, you would lose the ability to lift the monitor into a cost. Right. There's right. no cost to that. Um, so you were mentioning earlier that you could replace, uh, or you, you could you could sequence, or you could parallelize these applicative actions uh, using some sort of fork join. Um, does that apply here as well? Uh, here, I think here here it matters uh, the order. Yeah. Uh, so so independence doesn't imply uh, free of ordering. 
but like in in, in some cases, I, I believe like in the uh, in Scala's future, I think it's in Haskell called async. Uh, and in that particular applicative, it happens that you can run those in parallel, but or, or concurrently. My my question is um, uh, the um, is the interpreter the thing that's actually choosing to do these things in parallel, or do you have to specifically choose the applicative that you actually? So the this thing, uh, whatever G you end up picking, mm -hmm. uh, basically decides how what what's going to actually happen in interpretation. So if the G, if the applicative G, uh, so so the magic happens uh, in this line. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the that that app operation does things in, in parallel, uh, then that's what's going to happen when you interpret. Mm -hmm. So in one sense, what you're gaining here from using applicative instead of format is that you can actually compose them, which is great. Yeah, so composing them is really important and doing any sort of static analysis uh, on the structure, right? So with, with a monad, you would find a way quickly that you would not be able to uh, count the number of operations. Because in order to do that, you would actually need to run the program to get the next, the program to get the next step, right? So you have M of A, and you need to actually have the A value in hand before you can get the M of B. Whereas with applicative, you have those two up front. Uh, so, so one thing that might be worth trying is so try to write a, a, a valid a monad instance for validated that would be con, that would be consistent with the thing that you'll find that you can. Or so just, what I'm saying about composition, you can compose these two indefinitely written applicative instances that you can. Yeah, that's not thing you would get applicative. Monads don't don't we're not composed. Okay. I mean, I don't think so. With so if you needed to do a monad because of ordering, you couldn't do the count ups anymore? Right. Try to write a monad instance for const. I'm not saying do it now. Like, do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, problem. But, uh, yeah. Exercise for the reader. Uh, but you'll find that you, you, you just can't. Uh, and it's because of uh, monads are capturing the idea of sequentiality. Like you, you could count, but you would have to actually yeah. You'd, have, you'd have to have a way of running the, the actual events if you want to count the operations. Because you don't know the structure of your program until runtime. You could provide fake data. <laughs> you could provide fake data, but you'd have to like yeah, know yeah, that it matches the structure you care about. Right. It's just that like when you have a function uh, that returns like a B and you want to know what that B is, well, you're going to have to give that function an argument. Yeah. So maybe, so maybe one intuition is uh, you have an IO action that, that asks the user for a user ID. And then if that user ID is even, you'll just give them like an empty list. And then if the user ID is on, then you'll give them like this massive program with a bunch of operations, right? Without running, without actually getting that user ID, you don't know which branch you're going to take. And so you can't do the stack analysis. So you'd have to use something like the, the writer key, right? when I transform or something like that, which will execute it within the effect, right? So, so the big thing is, uh, this, this analysis, this count ops is happening outside of the IO. So you could, you, that's what you did. You yeah. did it without the IO. If you're okay with count ops moving inside the IO, then you could, then you could it would basically be the writer. When I so you can still do it, you just gotta go to more trouble to do it. Yeah. You gotta actually like run the, run the thing. Right? So here, if I drop IO, I didn't even care about running the actual program. I can still count the number of operations. Okay. Sorry, one more question. One more question. Um, I uh, I missed the beginning. Uh, is this code somewhere? But where is this link on the uh, Not yet, but I'll push it to my GitHub uh, afterwards. Okay. Thanks. And what's your GitHub? Uh, I it will be my first name and then the letter and then the first letter of my last name. Uh, so it'll be Adelbert C. <clears throat> uh, I think this worked out well because I'm out of time and I'm done with my slides. <laughs> Thank you.